Hi there, Dr. P here again. Today we're going to take a look at some of the sedentary evidence for ancient Lake Idaho. I'll start by first sharing some background information on this lake, and then we'll be making virtual field visits to three different sites. These sites have sedimentary features indicating the former presence of this ancient lake. If you look at a relief map of Idaho, it's easy to see what's been called a large smile in the southern half of the state. This indicates a region of low relief, which is the Snake River Plain. It extends from the eastern boundary with Wyoming all the way across the state and makes up more than half of the western boundary with Oregon. This area of low relief has traditionally been subdivided into the eastern Snake River Plain and western Snake River Plain. Lake Idaho, when it existed, occupied part or even most of the western Snake River Plain. Next, let's look at some of the characteristics or main features of Lake Idaho. First, this was a very large lake with a surface area at its maximum of about 7,000 square miles. This would make it about the same size as current day Lake Ontario of the Great Lakes. Lake Ontario is the easternmost and smallest of the five Great Lakes. Now let's add Lake Idaho to this map. One can clearly see that if ancient Lake Idaho at its maximum size existed today, it would be the largest body of water in the western United States. Indeed, it would have a surface area nearly four times the size of present-day Great Salt Lake in Utah. Let's take a look at the extent of Lake Idaho in more detail. There's evidence of it as far east as about Twin Falls, Idaho, and it extended in a northwest direction into Oregon beyond the location of present-day Ontario. This is a distance on the order of 150 miles. The width of the lake could be up to 50 miles. This map is one of several different interpretations one can find in the literature for the extent and shape of Lake Idaho. We'll use this as a base map for our virtual field visits. The map on the previous slide is from Sean Wilsey's excellent 2017 book, Geology Underfoot in Southern Idaho. This book has about two dozen well-described field excursions you can do if you like to get out and look at rocks in person. It's available various places, including the gift shop at the Idaho Museum of Mining and Geology. A second characteristic of Lake Idaho is that it existed for a long period of time, probably about 10 million years. Now I should say, during this interval of time, it didn't constantly remain the same size. It would expand and contract depending on changes in climate and the amount of moisture available in the region. This is a simplified time diagram covering the interval that Lake Idaho existed. The second column has the abbreviation MYBP at the top, which stands for millions of years before present. Lake Idaho itself is represented by the vertical blue line. The lake came into existence sometime around 12 million years ago and finally went out of existence about 2 million years ago. Now note that both ends of this line are shown as dashes because we don't know exactly when it came into existence or when it finally disappeared. During the time the lake was around, it accumulated a lot of sediment, which lakes do very well. People have studied these sediments and divided them into two large units, the older Chalk Hills and the younger Glens Ferry. Both of these units contain fish fossils, which helps in determining the correct age. The time intervals for these two units are shown on the right side of the diagram. Note that both of these also have dashes at their beginning and ending because that is the same uncertainty in exact time. Note also that between the two are a series of question marks because toward the end of the Miocene, it appears that Lake Idaho might have shrunk considerably 
or even gone away completely. So it's a little uncertain what went on during this time. The third characteristic of Lake Idaho is because it was around for such a long time, it accumulated fairly thick layers of sediment. This sediment can range up to hundreds or thousands of feet thick. Let's take a look at some of this sediment in the field, because this is what we're going to be seeing in our field visits. Sand is an example of one type of material that accumulated in Lake Idaho, which was later cemented into sandstone. Most of the sandstone shown here is composed of sugar-sized grains of quartz with some felspar and a few other minerals mixed in. In a lake, sand this size usually deposits close to shore. A good place to examine sandstone is on the top of Table Rock in eastern Boise. This photo shows layers of sandstone that can be followed along the top of Table Rock, where sands and gravels eroded from the mountains to the north dumped into Lake Idaho. Siltstone is another type of rock found abundantly throughout the western Snake River Plain. Silt requires very quiet water in order to settle to the lake bottom, and it usually is an indication of deeper water. The rock in this photo is composed mostly of silt-sized grains with some sand. It's usually not well exposed because Lake Idaho siltstones erode very easily. Now this is a more typical way to see siltstones, as white zones on the sides of hills common throughout this region. In fact, much of the agriculture in the western Snake River Plain, like this vineyard, owes its existence to soils formed in part from Lake Idaho sediments. These lake bed sediments are visible in the background hills of this photo. Now onto some virtual field visits. Our first stop will be at Jump Creek, a recreational site west of Boise that would have been along the western shoreline in Lake Idaho time. I'll be using several Google Earth images to illustrate the locations of all of our field visits. Each will have a bar scale shown in the lower right corner for reference. The city of Boise is shown by the white rectangle on the right side and Jump Creek is about 30 miles west of there, not far from the Idaho-Oregon border. Moving in closer, Jump Creek is on the boundary of the western Snake River Plain and the Oahe Mountains. It's about eight miles southwest of the small town of Marsing. The attraction of Jump Creek is the 50-foot high waterfall shown in the lower right of this photo. The towering cliffs visible here are composed of the volcanic rock rhyolite, which was erupted near the beginning of Lake Idaho time. The next image will be an oblique view of Jump Creek and the nearby Wahi range front. The falls are hard to see here because of the shadow in the deep canyon, but you can see Jump Creek itself by the line of trees coming out of the shadow on the left. Instead of visiting the creek, however, we're going to hike up the trail crossing from the center of the photo and head toward the upper right. Our goal is to stand on the upper front of the volcanics about where the yellow X is shown. At our new position, one is looking into the western Snake River Plain from our elevated spot. The red-brown rocks along the left side are the volcanics. And as you might have guessed, the white material in the plain consists of Lake Idaho sediments. Now imagine you were standing out here several million years ago when Lake Idaho was still around. What would that look like? Well, maybe something like this, a large lake that stretched to the horizon. Now realize erosion has changed the shoreline over such a long time period, and the climate would have been much wetter, so there would be a lot more vegetation, but still, it was an impressive lake. Time to move on to our second stop, which is a road cut in eastern Oregon. 
This would have been in shallow water near a northwest shore of ancient Lake Idaho. The Vines Hill Road Cut is along Highway 20 west of the town of Vail, Oregon. Highway 20 can be easily accessed off Interstate 84 at Ontario after crossing over the Snake River. The river serves as the Idaho-Oregon state boundary in this area. The road cut itself is about 12 miles southwest of Vail. This is on one of the northwest arms of Lake Idaho, where the Malheur River drained into the lake. This river now cuts across old lake bed sediments and drains into the Snake River. We're now looking at the road cut from an oblique view, which nicely shows the northwest side of the cut. This cut is several hundred feet long and hosts a number of different sedimentary features. Let's get a closer view. Now we're standing on the opposite side of the road cut, looking at the north end. The top of the cut is about 100 feet above the level of the road. These sediments have been time correlated with the Chalk Hills unit in Idaho. Here's the south end. These lake bed sediments are much thicker than just this road cut. A nearby water well encountered nearly a thousand feet of Lake Idaho sediments when it was drilled. Let's look at some of the sedimentary details in this cut. Cross bedding, also known as cross stratification, is a common feature throughout this road cut. Here it's shown by the wavy pattern developed in the middle of this photo. Cross bedding is formed when sediments are deposited by currents, showing that this area had lots of moving water, probably because it was shallow and subjected to periodic storm waves, as well as water movement by streams draining into the lake. Here's another example of cross bedding, showing where one set of beds is cut off by another set of beds. This indicates water flowing different directions at different times. There are dozens of similar examples at the Vines Hill Road Cut. Another part of the cut where one can see a significant change in the style of sediment. Note how there are larger pieces of gravel in the top half as compared to the bottom half of the photo. In fact, this change occurred along a specific irregular surface shown by the yellow line. This suggests we're looking at a surface created by the remobilization of a lot of deposited sediment with the deposition of new coarser grained material. This could well be the result of a major storm event where new gravels were flushed into this area from shallower zones. Volcanism must have been common in this area during Lake Idaho times, as shown by these and many other beds of ash deposited with the sands and gravels from the surrounding streams. Pebbles and cobbles of volcanic rock are common at Vines Hill, which is further evidence of the active volcanoes in the region at the time. The light tan cobble in the center of this photo is somewhat rounded, suggesting it was rolled around maybe in a stream before being deposited in Lake Idaho. Careful examination even reveals pebbles of obsidian, which is volcanic glass. Obsidian often forms when magma cools so rapidly it will solidify, but not have time to crystallize. In other words, to grow crystals. Now, before we leave, let's go back to the north end to look at one more feature that's nicely exposed. It's this thing. Let's get closer to get a better view. We're looking at a fault formed after the sediment had been deposited. Let's see how to recognize this as a fault. Here I've highlighted two surfaces, both of which appear to be displaced. At the time of deposition, both of those surfaces would have been flat and continuous, but now have a step. Both show a similar amount of displacement in the same direction, with the right side going down 
relative to the left side. You can see several other surfaces that were also cut by the same fault and all have the same sense of displacement. Now it's time to move on to our third and last stop. The final field site will be near the town of Bruno, where we'll examine the contact between the Chalk Hills and the Glens Ferry. Now on this map, it appears we're well into the lake, but don't forget that the size of Lake Idaho changed considerably over 10 million years, whereas this map shows just the maximum extent. We're now heading southeast of Boise. Bruno is about 20 miles south of the town of Mountain Home, which is along Interstate 84. Bruno is a small hamlet on Highway 51 and lends its name to Bruno Dunes State Park a few miles to the east. Our field site is about six miles south of Bruno, shown by the yellow circle on this map. Our reason to visit this remote area is to examine both of these units, as well as the boundary between them. The exposures are in small ravines where local creeks have cut through the soft sediments and provided us with a view. The Chalk Hills and Glens Ferry are separated by an unconformity. Now an unconformity is a surface of erosion where the underlying unit was exposed at the earth's surface and a certain amount of it removed before the overlying unit began depositing. In this photo, the actual unconformable surface is along the base of the dark gray layer. The length of time and thickness of chalk hills removed are really not known. It may have been up to a million years based on some of the fossil dating that has been done. An unconformity really represents missing information. A closer view of this unconformity reveals light gray finer sands of the chalk hills directly overlaying by dark gray coarser sands and pebbles and even some fragments of petrified wood. The unevenness of this contact is not unusual for erosional surfaces. After the lake started coming back and the water got deeper, finer sands and silt started accumulating in the Glens Ferry, as was shown in the previous photo. Well, we've seen some of the sedimentary evidence for the existence of Lake Idaho. Even though the lake has long since vanished, plenty of indications still remain of its presence in the western Snake River Plain if we take the time to look for it. Thanks for joining me on our field excursion and be sure to visit the Idaho Museum of Mining and Geology to see additional evidence of ancient Lake Idaho.